as we return to our scriptures and our study, would you be so kind as to take your Bibles and turn, please, to Ephesians. We're going to come back to 2 Corinthians in just a few minutes, but let's go to Ephesians. Paul had ministered at Corinth, went on to Ephesus, and in the process of his ministry there, he's in another Greek city, and dealing with the Grecian world, they were all highly culturally influenced. And since we're talking about understanding our culture, let's continue to talk a little bit about what it is like to live in the culture. And we learn that from Paul. Chapter 5, uh, he's going to talk about uh, the world and the culture. And so I'm on page 5 of our notes in session 2, and how has culture not only affected me, but now how has culture affected my family? And that's why I read the book this morning, just to seeing how it's, it's impacting even how we think as husbands and wives. So I read from Mark Guncore on that. But what we're going to do is jump down a little bit in uh, uh, our thinking. I put something here in an introductory paragraph, and let me just take two minutes. This is a small rabbit, so the rabbit trail is not going to be real big. You can look in your footnotes or end notes, excuse me, at the end of the note materials we've given you about pages 25, 26 or so, and you'll see then an end note number five that talks about some of this. But my, my area that uh, I specialize in is called theology, um, uh, and, and my doctorate's in theology. So they call guys who do what I do theologians and, and, uh, um, and, and work with that. But um, the truth of the matter is, is you refer to what I get paid as as a theologian. But who does theology? And that's even an interesting expression to begin with. What do you mean by doing theology? Let me back up for a moment. God has never done theology. God doesn't do theology. God is not a theologian, okay? God does not do theology. God does truth. God's not a theologian. He's a truther. Does that make sense? He provides truth. Theo is the word God, T-H-E-O from the Greek word theos. Logos, L-O-G-O-S, is sometimes translated the word or word, words about or study of. The words about. Theology is simply the words about God, the study of God. Does it make sense? That's what theology means. And you can have Christian theology, etc. But when you do theology, it means how do you bring truth to a problem, in vitro fertilization, capital punishment, a Christian and war. Should we participate in war? Can I fire a nuclear weapon? What is my social responsibility in the political world? What about the Christian and, and name any issue, marriage, divorce, remarriage. The Christian and death, cremation versus burial. Bring any issue and you ask, what does the word of God say about it? Does it make sense? So where it does, how does truth weigh in on this? That is known as doing theology. So here's the question, who does theology? The answer is all of us, every day. We are all theologians. It's easier to point the finger at others and say, but you get paid to do it, you're a theologian. I get paid and live of that ministry, but we're all doing it. Does it make sense? All the time. Now, when you do theology... You bring two factors together. One is called the sources for doing theology, and the other is called the method, and how do we utilize those sources. 
There's a lot on method, and we can get into hermeneutics and the process, and we'll leave that go for a moment. But there's a whole process for how do we bring and exegete the passages of Scripture, categorize under then headings, and systematize it, and we call that systematic theology, etc. But the other part is, what are the sources for doing theology? Well, the primary source for doing theology is the Bible, the Word of God. It is the primary source. We use the expression sola scriptura, meaning what? Scripture alone is my source. However, when I read the Bible, if you look this way for a moment, um, I read the Bible through a lens. I can't read my, I, I'm nearsighted. And so if I read, I have to do this. So years ago, I ended up having to put on glasses. And then sometime in my late 40s, early 50s, um, I, something else developed. And that is the, the ability, I could see at a distance, but I couldn't see really well close. And so I got bifocals. Being vain, I didn't get the ones with the lines. I got the, you know, they're progressive, they're dotted. And so I have to sometimes look, you know, if I look like I'm suffering from <laughs> disease, I'm trying to find the little dots, you know, and line it up, okay? But I read through my lens. That lens that I read my, and when I come to the Scriptures, I bring some other sources, but they're secondary, Okay, this, one of the sources is called my ability to reason or think. Come, let us reason together, God says. And you think. Now, you have a thinker, okay? My dad used to say, God gave you a brain, now use it, okay? God says, I gave you a brain, now use it. Now, the brain, the ability to reason, has been taught. It's been crafted. It's been formed. And it's been formed by me going to school, you going to school. I went to school in Minnesota. Minnesota's in the United States. The United States is in this hemisphere. This hemisphere has a whole bunch of history associated with it. So my reasoner or my thinker has been highly shaped by the blank that I live in, culture. So the word culture is a synonymous term with how people reason or think. We use a very interesting word that's been developed the last 20 years to talk about how I see things through my lens, or we call it my view of the world, or my world view. I also, as I study and do theology, want to ask how people before me thought about this. So we refer to that as church history, okay, or tradition, or historical theology. It's another secondary source. And if you don't use it, you're going to find yourself becoming a Jehovah's Witness, a Mormon, or someone like that. Why? Because they just create what they believe was declared as a heresy almost 1,800 years ago. It's just that I don't want to hear what history says. I got this new idea. It is heresy. But we have that. So that's why we rely on historical theology. Does it make sense? It tells me, don't put your foot there, that's wrong. Others who did ventured away from the faith. Historical theology. So I have culture, my contemporary world. I have other theologians who are writing commentaries, etc. They're working on the same problem. I read them as well. So I think... I ask the dead guys, what do you think? And I ask other living people, what do you think? And then I, pro I, I, I make sure that I'm holding all that intention as I come to the Word of God. Bottom line is, your theology is only as good as your reliance on the Scriptures. Does it make sense? Okay. Now, 
the culture in which Paul lived was coming on him pretty heavy, all right, and challenging him. The Grecian culture prided themselves in having all the answers to everything. The Areopagus, etc., they felt we are the end all in all. The Grecians inflated their view of their understanding. After all, we gave the world democracy, we gave them this, we gave them that. Yeah, so yeah. Okay. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Okay, and now the new one, My Big Fat Greek Wedding too. All you have to do is ask some of the lead characters there, what do you think of the Greek world? All right? It's pretty funny, but yeah, you get the picture. That's kind of a, how the Greeks looked at themselves in the world. The Romans declared themselves with their Caesars to be gods. We are gods. The Greeks said, go ahead, call yourself whatever you want to. We are the ones who invented the gods. See, that's how they kind of thought of themselves. We put things out there. Well, Paul, writing to that world, talks about, as he says, what's going on in the world around us. He says, therefore, verse 1, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, given himself for us. As an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. And he says, but fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let not even be named among you as is fitting for the saints, neither filthiness nor foolishness nor talking. That's, and he goes on and he lays out for them a mandate that, of what they ought to avoid. But he then comes to verse 13 and says, now here's what you need to pay attention to. But all things, as he, as he says here, are made manifest in verse 13 by the light, for whatever is made manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will make you aware of what's going on around you. By the verse 13, everything is exposed by the light or made discovered, manifested, made laid wide open so you see what it really is. Look at our life. Look at your marriage. Look at what's going on around you and see it for what it really is. And he's challenging us in verse 14 then, arise, wake up, listen to what God is saying. And it's a call then, a clarion call to notice what's going on around us, okay? And it is so easy simply to say, but I have enough problems to worry about with my own family and my own job, the bottom line is this. God didn't take you and me to heaven when we were sinless the day we got saved. He left us here for a reason, to make a difference as salt and light. Now, if we're going to do that, and we need to be awake to the darkness around us, and he's making that contrast of light and darkness, and God repeatedly does that. You are light in a dark world. And it doesn't take a lot to light up this room. Turn off all the lights at night, be in here, and one candle will do the trick, okay? We can light it up so we're not stumbling around the room. You can then see the chairs and the aisleways, et cetera, and the steps, and all it takes is one little light. It's amazing what you and I can do. But in order for us to do that, and what keeps us from applying biblical principles like verse 15, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as the unwise or fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit." Be under the influence and control of the Spirit of God. Contrasting that with, with a, someone who is drunk, they are under the what? Influence of alcohol. So he's using a metaphor. The way that someone who is inebriated seems to be totally under that control, you need to be likewise controlled by the Spirit of God. Okay? So what's happening in our world? And, and notice what we have confusion. Notice we should then look with great intensity that we walk, and the term for walk is the way we conduct our lives, not as fools, or the idea is not as unwise. And why does this happen to us? What, what's going on? It's you and I listen to the world around us. We buy into things. And I put here as an illustration, we can act so foolish simply because we listen to the many voices around us. And most of them are uninformed totally. 
the uninformed advice of others who say, well, I've heard that, or sometimes I'll just call it for what it is, stupid comments from well-meaning friends, co-workers, unsafe friends who seem to have all the answers, and they've studied nothing when it comes to worldview. But we want to make sure that we don't offend them or whatever. We're also assaulted by social authorities who tell us now that marriage, for instance, is obsolete or it's degrading for a woman to be in subjection to any man or marriages are never meant to be something else. Why should a 22-year-old make a 50-year-old commitment or a 50-year commitment? And we can go on and on and on. And I said, and, and, and let me give you a title of a book or two that you ought to buy. Al Mohler, who's the president of the Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, and is on in, in, w- within the Southern Baptist, but Al Mohler's doctorate's in theology, and his specialty is culture. And he put out a 2015 piece called, We Cannot Be Silent. And he's saying, let us put back the word protest in Protestant. Okay calling for a modern-day reformation. Somebody needs to stand up and say, enough in our culture. So speaking truth to a culture of redefining sex, marriage, and the very meaning of right and wrong today. It's a 2015 piece put out by Nelson Books. Al Mohler, M-O-H-L-E-R, we cannot be silent. Go on Amazon, buy this book. It even covers some of the things I talked about last night in pre-modern, modern, modern, post-modern. You can get that, but he covers it too. He covers some of the same ground we do when we explain this because you need to understand how we got to where we are. He begins in his book by saying this, and listen as I read. The prophetic writer Flannery O'Connor rightly warned us years ago that we must, quote, push as hard as the age that pushes against you. In other words, push back. Christians were never... the, the The Christians who made an impact and the Bible believers who made an impact stood up, whether it was to a king and others, and said, enough, you're wrong. It cost them their lives. We are living in the midst of a revolution. The Christian church in the West now faces a set of challenges that exceeds, I'm going to use some superlatives because it's appropriate today. We now face a set of challenges that exceeds anything it has experienced in the past. The revolution that has transformed most of Western Europe and much of North America is a revolution, not a change, a revolution more subtle and more dangerous than revolutions faced in previous generations. This is a revolution of ideas, one that is transforming the entire moral structure of the meaning of life that human beings have recognized for millennia. This new revolution presents a particular challenge to Christianity for a commitment to the authority of Scripture and to reveal truths runs into direct conflict with the central trust of this revolution. Christians are not facing an isolated set of issues that causes us to be merely perplexed and at times at odds with the larger culture. We are instead facing a redefinition of marriage and the very transformation of the family. We are facing a complete transformation of the way human beings relate to one another in the most intimate contexts of life. We are facing nothing less than a comprehensive redefinition of life, love, liberty, and the very meaning of right and wrong. I want to read a couple of things here, a couple of paragraphs. British theologian Theo Hobson has argued that the scale and scope of this challenge is completely unprecedented in human history. According to critics of Hobbes, argument, the challenge of the sexual revolution, for instance, and the normalization of homosexuality, for example, is nothing new or unusual. Churches have always shown the ability to plod their way through hard moral issues before, and so they will again with homosexuality. Hobson himself confesses that he would have agreed with this line of reasoning at one point, but not anymore. For Hobson, the issue of marriage and homosexuality presents the church with a challenge it has never, ever faced before. Why is 2016 different than anything we've ever seen in culture? By the way, we don't know what to do and how to do with it. HB2 in North Carolina, the bathrooms issue, 
I have a focus on the family wrote to us two days ago and asking what has Colonial Baptist put in policy So because we have churches in Denver and others that are looking forward to how they should deal with it. I had to write back and say, we, it, 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 it caught us off guard. We're writing and formulating policies for our facilities uses, but we've never been here before. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is, this is ground none of us have tread upon, ever. Why is such a challenge Christianity so new? Hobson has suggested that the first factor is the either-or quality of this new morality, either hyphen or, either or. There is no middle ground now in the church's engagement with homosexuality, LGBTQ. Either churches will affirm the legitimacy of same-sex relationships and behaviors, or they will not. The legislature in North Carolina is faced with that. It's an either-or. We've never had either ors. We've always tried to soft pedal our way through, make everybody happy. Not in 2016. That's new. And the politicians don't know what to do with it. It's new. Hobson's second factor is the new morality's rapid rate of success. It's new and it is moving at speeds we never anticipated. The normalization of homosexuality, something regarded as speakably immoral for centuries, has happened at breakneck speed. It has happened so fast that homosexuality is now considered as a legitimate lifestyle and one that deserves legal protection. Moreover, as Hobson has argued, the speed of this new morality success has basically ousted traditionalist sexual morality from the high ground. In other words, the sexual revolution has actually turned the tables on Christianity. The Christian church <clears throat> has long been understood by the culture at large to be the guardian of what is right and wrong. Do you catch that? For many years, we were the guardians of morality. But now, the situation is reversed. Boom. Revolution. The culture generally identifies Christians now as on the wrong side of morality. That's completely new. This revolution is now so complete that those who will not join in it are understood to be deficient, intolerant, and harmful to society. What was previously understood... <clears throat> To be immoral is now celebrated as morally good. The church's historic teaching on homosexuality, for instance, shared by the vast majority of the culture until very recently, is now seen as a relic of the past and a repressive force <coughs> excuse me, that must be eradicated. This explains why the challenge of the moral revolution poses such a threat to the whole of Christianity and to its position in modern society. And yet, even as we understand this revolution to be a new thing, its roots are not. What now becomes clear is that most Christians vastly underestimated the challenge of the sexual revolution that's been happening for the past 50 years. We just sort of thought, well, that's just kind of the culture and it'll be a fad that passes and suddenly it became encoded as the accepted social lifestyle and the law of the land and when you now violate the law you need to be dealt with because you do not have the best interest of society in mind guess who has become anti-law and in North Carolina, we are so anti-law that the mayor of Baltimore says, avoid the state of North Carolina. I will not authorize any employee who works for the state to travel there. Why? Because they don't let the bathrooms be transgender. I'll put it this way. Have we lost our minds? Yeah. 
And it's, folks, it is one unstoppable. We've encoded it into the law. Number two, and as Moeller and others said, and those of us who study it, it will not be reversed. Okay. Abortion will not be reversed. Transgenderism, homosexuality, will not be reversed. We're not going back to anything or marching into the future. That's the life we now face. What's the cost? It's going to cost us legalities with our churches. First thing to go is going to be what? Tax exemption. Number two, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and banks, you will not get money in the future for loans to build church buildings. You're not compliant. So there won't be the building of the mega churches, etc. It's impossible you won't have the money. Does it make sense? You can't get a loan. This institution, because of its doctrine, will not get bank loans. It's not going to happen. It just keeps cascading. Are you with me in that? Government contracts wouldn't be awarded to the military who violated Title IX of diversity. North Carolina, for instance, stands to lose millions upon millions upon millions of dollars to students who want to go to college at the colleges in the state. The federal government will say there are no student loans for college. You cannot apply for Title IV loans, Pell Grants, or anything. You cannot go to college and get money to fund your college education in North Carolina if the state is not compliant with Title IX. Now, what will the taxpayers do when that gets mandated by the federal government? It's called caving. Does it make sense? Title IV funds will not happen if Title IX is violated. They're tied together. So when it comes, and get ready, because the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and others are all lockstep. The ACC and Sports League, they're all lockstep saying, as a legislature, out of their mind. I use North Carolina because I live there. It's a great test case for the rest of the nation. That's the day in which we live. And for us as Christians, when it now said, your kids no longer get college loans or deferments on their loan payments from college or grad school or post-grad school, people go, oh, then, oh, now it does hit home. Does it make sense? It hits home. So, if the culture wanted to do one thing, hit us in the what? Pocketbook. It's now the law, federal law of the land. And the Attorney General of the United States is looking at the violators of it and is now put out and is suing the governor of the state of North Carolina. And they're in a lawsuit to take it all the way to the highest courts in the land. Why? It's all a test case. But watch how it impacts Christianity going forward. Interesting days in which we live. Most exciting time to be a Christian. Absolutely most. Thank you, God, that I'm alive in this day to see it. And, that, and you ought to just thrill that we are born now than in the Middle Ages or any other time. That you and I have a privilege to be in the darkest time in history. I love it. Love it. Absolutely love it. Why? Because in the darkest, you get to be the brightest. Okay? And for my kids and others, we were talking about last night, what does this mean for our grandkids? Okay? I'm going to teach them hallelujah. You get to be born in the darkest time in history. Darkest time for Christianity. Why? You get to be a light, and when it's lit, you will light up more. Because we thought... We just sort of blend it into all the other light. By the way, it will probably cost you your life. Okay. 
You may get to die for Christ or go to prison. But you're bright. You're bright. Now shine brightly. That's what's going to be asked of us. So when you look at this and you look at the culture, do you believe God is sovereign? Do you believe that? Did any of this catch him by surprise? Not a bit. Did he know it was coming? He told us about it in Scripture, 2 Timothy 3. It's called the tribulation period. Praise God, what's going to happen to us beforehand? Auf Wiedersehen, okay? We're gone, okay? It does not say, though, that there's not going to be a horrific time leading up to it. Make sense? We're probably going to be experiencing that. And it could be, there's been martyrdom through history. It's going on today in other cultures, in Indonesia and other places. It's just now coming for the first time in comfortable America. But America has all the eyes of the world on it as well. But this is what we're in for in our country. And we're, and where others are dying for the faith, we're dying for the, will be dying or losing everything financially for the moral cause. And I don't think it will actually take our lives. I think it's going to take our property and our prospects for the future. Okay? Jobs, loans, education costs, everything. We will become marginalized, almost singled out and isolated. So that's where it's going to hit us. It'll hit us financially in ways never seen before. In the research triangle where we live, IBM Corporation, they teach diverse values and everything and that people have to go through. And we have hundreds of employees that work at those institutions in order to continue on working in the six-digit, two, three hundred thousand jobs, you have to become compliant. And so if you cannot, in management or whatever structure, agree to this or teach these, you, you lose your job. So when you're making $350,000 a year, which is a lot of money, or, or lose your job, your faith really is on the, on the line. That's what's happening. So people will have to say, I, I'm not going to do that. I'll walk away. I will no longer be the director of this. I will no longer be the CIO, the chief information officer for our systems. I'll resign. And that's where we live. Okay. So it's not going to hit us in the Oh, you're asked to go out in the streets. and No, no you're asked to give up your $300,000 job. Now it becomes real because now the home that we bought that cost $1.1 million, uh, you have to sell or foreclose on. It's, you cannot retain it. I see the day where we separate out those Christians who are really committed from those who aren't. That's a really tough place to be. Population of our churches. I'm in a mega church. We were talking about it earlier this morning in an elders meeting as we got together here this morning. Easter, we run 5,500 people. This keeps up a couple more years. On Easter Sunday, we won't run half that. Make sense? That's just where we're headed. Why? Because... This is, wow, I want to be a Christian, but I don't want to have to do that. For sake of time, let me show you what I've done. Talking about the confusion, I wanted to spend a few minutes not running off on that diatribe. That's the culture. That's what Paul lived through. A day of confusion, a day of busyness. He talks about the days are evil, redeeming, trying to buy up time. Page 6, a day of insensitivity being unwise, but instead understanding what the will of God is. You and I live in a culture that he talks about the will of God is to be pure and holy, and he deals with that, and that means be careful what you view and what you think, what you feel and where you go, and we live in a day of rampant, and Moeller's book deals with it more beautifully than anything that you can read on this one here. We cannot be silent. you got to read it. But what is happening to our young people and what has happened since 1930 is the constant exposure to 
the 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 the, the promiscuous, a, a promiscuous sensual society in which we live, which appeals so much to the body and whatnot in its senses. I finally then just quote Bob Record, who writes this on page seven. At any given moment, every one of us is only one step away from stupid. Okay, and that's by that he's talking about pornography and thinking this, and we really are that. And then escapism. Well, I'm just, there is no way to escape. You're in it, okay? Before we take a break for five minutes, I want to go to page eight. Is this, does your start out with a new page eight? A culturally shaped generation has now arrived. Do we do that? Okay. At the single largest age group in America, the single largest entity that we've ever dealt with is not the baby boomers. It's a group now called, they're 78 million strong, referred to as the millennials. There's never been a group that large ever. Those born between 1980 and 2000. Who's born in here between 1980 and 2000? Okay, quite a few. That's the largest group ever. And no offense to them, you are the first generation now that has grown up, that has grown up completely trained and educated in what you and I would call a postmodern world. Every one of us born before that were educated in the cross between modernity and postmodernity. This is a generation of postmoderns. And life and everything is approached and thought differently, categorically. Who are the millennials, page 8? 30 uh, are teenagers to 30-somethings between 15 to 35 years old, been dubbed the millennial generation. Okay? And you can read about some of the characteristics about them. By the way, I feel bad because most of the millennials, whether it be Time Magazine, USA Today, whatever, they use some terms that are not always what I would call flattering. Notice, for instance, a story in Time Magazine says polls show that millennials want flexible work schedules, more me time on the job, nearly nonstop feedback, and career advice for managers. Another Time article was harsher, titled The Me, Me, Me Generation. It begins, they're narcissistic, lazy, coddled, bit delusional. They aren't just unfounded negative stereotypes for about 80 million Americans born between 80, 1980 to 2000. They're backed up by a decade of sociological research. So they study them and, and whatnot. I take a different approach to that. Um, I've, page 9, find that they can also be described in positive ways, meaning the adjectives confident, self-expressive, upbeat, receptive to new ideas and ways of living. They're generally regarded as being more open-minded. There is a spirit, of, if not tiresome, debate over whether they are self-entitled narcissists or open-minded do-gooders, somewhere in between. Now, here's, and, and I've written this because I didn't want to just read off the notes, but let me tell you the, the characteristics of millennials and where the future church will lie. Notice on page 9, first of all, they sometimes are described as being special. They have always been treated as special as important and important. This generation has been the most wanted. Every milestone was marked with celebrations and praise. They carry a sense, of, a sense of entitlement about them. It's been instilled in them that they're vital to the nation and their parents' sense of purpose. They feel they are here to solve the world problems older generations couldn't. They may even claim they want privacy, but they don't. Sheltered, highly protective, their parents are known as what? Helicopter parents. And when I worked as a vice president at college, we would have parents... Got so bad that in Tampa, Florida, when they had the job fairs held at the convention center, the parents went with the graduates from college on the interviews to make sure then that the companies presented, whether it be Edward Jones Financial or the Department of Defense, the parents went sure to make sure that my child gets all the benefits due them. It's like, I can tell you one thing as an employer, if dad showed up with you at your interview, you do not get hired, okay? <laughs> you understand what I'm thinking? But it's just kind of weird. They do not call. Now, the millennials are having children. They are not helicopter parents. The term is used, they are drone parents, okay? They don't helicopter and hoover over. 
hover over them, they drone over, they, can, they do flybys. And there's a whole lot of science to that. They are confident, more team-oriented, page 10, achieving. They feel pressured. It is very hard being a millennium, millennial. They grew up in a Facebook generation, meaning everybody's putting their best image on Facebook. It's, whole, it's hard to measure up. When some mother says, my 19-month-old my child is walking, working on a computer, and speaks three languages. And you look at, well, how am I failing as a parent? My kids don't do that. What am I doing wrong? What school are you enrolling your kids in that they've learned French, Spanish, and Japanese by the age of two? Okay, and, and, and it's like, <laughs> I can't get my kids in those schools. I'm a failure. It's hard to live in that, okay? In a sense, they're conventional, family-oriented, but you know what? I'll say two things, and I have to move up here. They are the most unchurched, 80 million strong, unchurched generation. They have no affinity for the organized church. Now, they are not religious. They do claim to be spiritual. And you can read more on that. Spirituality is a really big deal for them. Religion and doctrine is not. Now, here's the question for you. No answers? Just think about it. How do you define spiritual? It's really in the category of metaphysical. Okay. And spiritual, well, you can work on that, okay? And, and what we mean by that. They're also technological, page 11. They are the most plugged in, knowledgeable generation or have access to knowledge of any generation. And they become intolerant of those who cannot rapidly, I love the commercial on TV, where the grandparents are so relieved that the grandkids have come. Why? Because now you can turn on the TV and all the other stuff for us. We can't figure it out. Do you have, how many of you have seen that commercial? And tell me. It's awesome. Okay? Now, the reason it's awesome is because my grandson can do things for me. I, I just had him, and his name is Andrew, little guy, and he just turned 13. And I say, Bubba, I hand you three remotes. <clears throat> Make them into one, okay, and, and get that thing on for me, okay? And it doesn't take him long, and he can just, and he has no problem. He has no problem going into a computer, and it's like, dude, you're into the brains of my computer, and I'm frightened because it's all going to disappear. Oh, don't worry, Dad, uh, uh, Papa, yeah, I'll, I'll get it all fixed. And it's like, the screen just disappeared. I'll bring it back. And it's like, you know, and he's doing things on my computer, and it's like, oh, my goodness, Okay? And so the NSA is going to come and investigate me. You keep this up, you know. And he's going, no, I got you covered. You know, and he's just, <laughs> they think nothing of it. And they have knowledge. Okay. okay. By the way, do you know the difference between knowledge and understanding and wisdom? The Bible tells us to get what? Wisdom. wisdom. Knowledge, it's 32 degrees Water freezes at 32 degrees. Okay. Understanding, 32 degrees is cold. You can get sick if you go outside because your immune system is weakened by, through all that. When it's 32 degrees, you, you're, you're susceptible to illnesses, etc. Wisdom. If I'm going outside and it's 32 degrees, I ought to put a coat on. You understand what I'm saying? It's the application. Knowledge alone does not constitute what? Wisdom. That's part of what we're dealing with today, okay? Technological. Here come the children of the millennials. You can read that on pages 11, 12, 13, and 14. And I've written this for an assignment for us today to take with us in study. Page 14, I'm getting older. Am I getting better? 
Okay, we use those expressions of fine wines. I'm not at all, I'm a complete abstainer when it comes to alcohol and, and whatnot. I grew up in a German beer drinking society and, and I was deeply into alcohol. I was an alcoholic at 21 and um, uh, out of the military and whatnot. So m my life just completely radically changed with those things. But I use an expression that I used to hear it's not getting older, it's getting better. One of the most charged conversations, page 14, on any church staff occurs when we get into strategic planning discussions. How should we pl plan and prepare for the future? What should our church look like in the days ahead? Where is our optimal church location? How do we attract young families? How should we plan our worship services? Who should be given primary consideration when it comes to worship service musical taste? How do we develop new and fresh thinking leadership? Generations think differently. That is not new to our day. But with people living longer, the church is going to be more intra-generational than it has ever been. There will be more generations, millennials, etc. And so what Time Magazine here a month ago had an article entitled, this is very interesting, Your Longevity is Good for Business. This is the March edition. Let me just read this and then we'll break for a couple minutes. Global businesses wouldn't think of ignoring China. Nearly all of the Fortune 500 companies have a presence there. Flooding into new markets makes sense, especially with 1.4 billion people. So why aren't more businesses targeting people that are 50 plus years of age? This is a global market nearly the size of China. And it is entirely new in the sense that people this age have never before had so much spending power, staying power, and ambition. Joseph Coughlin, director of the MIT Age Lab, writes this, the problem is a total absence of imagination. Then he goes on, marketers still present these years as filled with golf, cruises, and rocking chairs. That model, though, they write of later life may be dated, but it is a struggle to fully understand what is replacing it. Here's the way experts on aging describe it. People past 50, past 50 in America, control 70% of the nation's disposable income. If they aren't working, they may be volunteering or starting a small business or nonprofit or taking enrichment classes. Many remain socially active and want to look and feel great, and they're going to spend their money to get that experience. The next generation, Coughlin writes, of retirees expect to go out in fashion and with style. I say all that to say there's a whole article that goes on and on. Somebody forgot about the 50s, 60s, and 70-year-olds. Uh, what's that? 80-year-olds. Um, and the, go the government said we got to raise retirement age now to 70. We keep on going. The old people, us, I'm 64, they ain't going away. They're not dying as fast as people thought they would. As a matter of fact, the new things in medicine, etc., they're living what? They're hanging around. And they're holding on to their money and their positions because they're healthy. They're eating better. They're living longer. They're studying. They're reading. They're researching. And they really can operate computers. And if you read Forbes, I don't know how many of you get Forbes magazines, they do carry articles on the 30 most impacting 30 and under, but the majority of people making the big impact are in their 70s and 80s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. They're setting up the foundations. They're doing the heavy lifting. They're hanging around, and they're in our churches with their wisdom. Somebody ought to listen to them, okay? It would be good for us to do that. And so I say all that because 
I'm going to close with this section, and then we'll break, and I'm just going to introduce something to us here. How many of you have read John Piper's book, Don't Waste Your Life? Some of you have. I'm going to read something. The opposite of wasting your life is living by a single God-exalting, soul-satisfying passion. The well-lived life must be God-exalting and soul-satisfying because that is why God created us. And Jesus reminds us that he spits lukewarm people out of his mouth. He goes on to say this, and he talks about, I want to tell you what a tragedy is, he says on page 45. I will show you how to waste your life. Consider a story from the 2000 edition of Reader's Digest, which tells about a couple who took early retirement from their jobs in the Northeast five years ago when he was 59 and she was 51. Now they live in Punta Gorda, Florida, where they cruise on their 30-foot trawler playing softball and collecting shells. At first when I read it, he says, I thought it might be a joke, a spoof on the American dream, but it wasn't. Tragically, this was the dream in America. Come to the end of your life, your one and only God-given precious life, and let the last great work of your life before you give an account to Jesus Christ be this, playing softball and collecting shells. Picture them standing before Christ at the great judgment day. Look, Lord, see my shells. That is a tragedy. And people today are spending billions of dollars to persuade you to embrace that tragic dream. Over against that, I put my protest. Don't buy what the culture says. Don't waste your life. In his book, Culture Shift, the other book you ought to buy by Al Mohler, he closes it out on redefining retirement. The concept of retirement is rather recent in origins. Most historians trace retirement back to Germany's Iron Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, who pushed through a series of social changes in the late 19th century. Among those changes was a system very much like our social security system intended as a guaranteed pension for the elderly. Bismarck's idea was that workers in Germany would need to give way so that younger men would be able to enter the workforce and support their families. In other words, we need to move the old people out to make room. The concept of retirement from the workforce took root, and by the midpoint of the 20th century, right after World War II, most American workers expected to retire close to the age of 65. The contemporary idea of retirement was a life of travel, leisure, golf, and a time with grandchildren. In states like Florida, California, Arizona, entire communities of retirees emerged. Leisurevilles advertised a concept of the good life that was free from employment and largely, if not exclusively, devoted to the withdrawal from the world of all work. These communities are now in trouble. The concept of retirement is changing, brought about by the economic recession that has propelled many older Americans back into the workforce. And then he starts quoting USA Today, et cetera, going on. I say all that to say there are not only seismic culture shifts going on about millennials and young people, but older of us as well. The concept of retirement was never God-invented. It's part of the culture. So what are you doing with our life or your life? How are you using that to become an expatriate? In other words, to take three months of your life when you have Social Security and all and go and serve on a mission field. Help out younger missionaries. Be a grandparent to their kids. Work around the church. We have to come up with entire new paradigms of teaching, working, etc. But we're living in the American dream. I hope you're realizing some of the things we brought out today. The whole American dream concept is in peril. And it is becoming more and more anti Christian. And when the economics start hitting, I don't know if we can afford that much investment anymore in medication. 
we're talking about legalized what? Get ready. If they alter the home and life and everything we know like this, what's coming in about 10 more years? Not only social medicine, but legalized, yeah, euthanasia. Okay. So, we did nothing to stop abortion. Nothing. And we lost that platform politically in the Republican Party and everything. It's done. Okay, what are we going to do about the other end? Are you with me? We need to stop being silent. Okay, let's take a break for a few minutes. Then we'll answer questions, okay?